Hello everyone and welcome to Ed Zotta Review's World Tour! Since I've just been released from my North Korean prison, I'm ready to roam the world again. These five episodes are all about visiting countries that are not Japan, the US or a well-known European country, and shine a light on the history of this country's car industry. And this is destination number four. Is there a parallel universe? Is there a universe similar to ours, yet different? I don't believe in a multiverse, but I do believe a country named Canada exists. Canada, a strange corner of the world with even stranger cars that look much like ours, but a bit different. Welcome everyone to episode 27 of the Automotive History series where I take you on a hike through the mountainous area known as the Canadian car industry with its many weird alternative universe cars. Let's see what all the fuss is about, eh? The auto industry in Canada started off much like any other well-industrialized country. At the turn of the century, all over the country, fathers and sons who formerly worked on repairing bikes, carriages and motorcycles gave a shot at making their first automobile, motorcar or whatever you name it. The Fossmobile being touted as Canada's very first maple syrup uh, petrol-fueled motorcar in 1897. And yes, this is the third time I've been saying it like this. Anywho, the Canadian car industry was off to a very great start. By 1918, Canada was the proud owner of the world's second largest car industry. But was it an industry they could be proud of? Not really, as the industry was made up of numerous small-time companies that only made a handful of cars every year. One notable company was McLaughlin. McLaughlin started out as a carriage builder, how original, but made the transition to cars in the early 1900s with the help of American Buick. Buick provided much needed car parts and McLaughlin did the rest. Soon enough, McLaughlin became the General Motors of Canada and the cars were renowned for being solidly built and rich and royal families in other parts of the British Empire took an interest in them. They kept on building cars under the McLaughlin name until American General Motors bought McLaughlin in 1918. The mark would then exist as McLaughlin Buick until 1942, when the McLaughlin part was dropped altogether and the brand became known as just Buick. In the meantime, foreign competition was on the rise. At the turn of the century, Ford already announced his presence by crossing the Detroit River and building a factory in Windsor, which became known as the Detroit of Canada, right across the Detroit of America, named Detroit, on the other bank of the Detroit River that runs alongside Detroit. Some other American car companies followed and by the 1930s, as a result of the Great Depression, the Canadian car industry consolidated and many small-time car makers vanished. What remained were the big boys, mostly American. The Canadian government feared that the local market would be dominated by the mass market, low priced but good quality cars from the neighbors down south. And not only that, Canada was used by American car makers as some sort of a loophole. Since Canada was a member of the British Empire, it could take advantage of lower import tariffs from other countries that were also member, better known as the Imperial Preference. So, Let's say that England really doesn't want their local car market also to be flooded by American cars. They insert an import tariff, specifically geared toward the USA. American car companies would then make right-hand drive models in Canada and export them through Canada to the British Empire because there is no high import tariff between the members of the British Empire. Get it? Canada was getting increasingly dependent on the United States. Not much was produced in Canada, but plenty was imported from the US. So, by 1936, the Canadian government imposed a 35% tariff on the auto import from the USA. You have to understand that Canada's car industry shows an uncanny similarity with the Australian car industry two episodes prior. Canada, much like Australia, has a colonial history and is part of the British Commonwealth and has a rather protective government. This also heavily influenced the Canadian car industry. Throughout time, plenty of British cars were sold over in Canada because of its Commonwealth roots, plenty of French cars were sold over in Canada because of its French colonial roots, and plenty of American cars were sold over there because, well, the southern neighbors owned the more resourceful parts of the North American continent. 
With the new import tariffs, Canada gave the American car makers a choice. You can either import your domestic models but expect heavy import tariffs, or build them locally over here and support the local economy. And this led to an interesting situation leading to an automotive landscape that almost looked like an alternative universe, spanning the 40s, 50s and 60s. Let's have a look. First and foremost, which is also a Canadian company by the way, First and foremost, American car companies found a new loophole. Besides importing their domestic models, uh, import tariff included, they decided to launch Canada-specific models and brands with locally built cars, and this is what the government initially wanted. But these cars were essentially the same, with some minor changes in the exterior look and had a Canadian-inspired name, and voila, this was regarded as being enough to make a truly unique Canadian model. Let's start with the Ford Motor Company. For some odd reason I just can't find an answer to, it wasn't base level Ford, but mid-level Mercury that became Canada's favorite brand within the Ford stable. Here is what happened. Besides Canada's largest cities, the countryside is sparsely populated, with towns not large enough to support a separate Ford and Mercury dealer. Ford also couldn't start up a Ford Mercury dealer in every town because of the import tariff, as it would mean that Ford now would only sell imported American models with heavy retail prices. So, Ford had a plan. The low-priced Ford dealers would receive a new upscale Canadian brand, Monarch. This is essentially a Mercury with some Ford trim glued onto it and voila, an upscale 100% Canadian model was born. Ford put the same trick in reverse with Mercury. Small towns with only a Mercury dealer would also receive a new cheaper brand, Meteor. This is essentially a Ford with some Mercury trim glued on it, and voila, a low-priced 100% Canadian model was born. So, in one town you would find a Ford Monarch dealer, where Monarch is the replacement of Mercury, and in other towns you'd find a Mercury Meteor dealer, where Meteor would replace Ford. Uh, are you still with me? Only a couple more minutes to go, trust me. And then in 1960, Ford launched an entirely new mark, Frontenac, which is pretty much a Ford Falcon with a lot of maple leaves glued onto it and some extra chrome. And a funny side note is that the Frontenac already featured maple leaf emblems before the leaf was part of the newly designed national flag in 1965. But let's dive a bit deeper into these two brands, Monarch and Meteor, and enter the parallel universe. Regular American Mercury's turned into Monarchs, Suddenly, a Mercury Montclair was also a Monarch Lucerne, but with a different grille and trim pieces. As mentioned before, the compact Ford Falcon became the Frontenac, just Frontenac, for only one year. Ford Econoline vans became Mercury Econolines, and the Ford Fairlane became the Meteor Rodeau. Now, I find this car very attractive to look at. It essentially is a Ford with some extra chrome on it, but it works. I really dig the massive chrome V over the front grille. But here is something I don't understand. Americans love the chrome on their automobiles, so why do the Canadian counterparts have even more of it? If you as a viewer can tell me more about this, please let me know, I'd, I'd love to know. Because is it to blind bears on a sunny hot summer's day? Or is it because Canadians love chrome even more than Americans would do? I mean, in my eyes, the Rideau now looks more American than its American counterpart. But let's move on. Rivaling General Motors pulled roughly the same trick, albeit a bit more subdued. For some odd reason I just can't find an answer to, it wasn't low-priced Chevrolet, but mid-level Pontiac that became Canada's favorite brand within the GM stable. Whereas Pontiac was considered a mid-level mark in the US, it was a low-priced mark in Canada, to make things even more confusing. By the early 50s, GM expanded the Pontiac model range with Canada-specific models with French-sounding names like the Laurentian and the Parisienne. And the Parisienne is the one to look out for. By 1953, the Pontiac Parisienne was truly Canadian. It had a Canadian name and was assembled locally. But as soon as GM introduced the V8 engines in the mid-50s, it decided to share Chevrolet's V8 with Pontiac. Now, you drove a Pontiac with Chevrolet V8 under the hood. And from here on out, the relationship between American Chevrolet and Canadian Pontiac only became closer. By the early 1960s, Canadian Pontiacs rode on a Chevrolet platform and chassis, had a Chevy engine, but had Pontiac body and design. Sometimes the Canadian Pontiacs were rebranded Chevrolets, such as is the case with the new mark called Acadian, 
Much like Ford offered the Compaq from Tanakh, so did GM with Acadian, a Compaq car and retrimmed Chevy 2. Which is odd, as Pontiac already sold a Compaq car back in the US, the Tempest, but that one wasn't allowed to be sold in Canada for some odd reason, so here, be happy with the Chevy 2 with a different grille. <sighs> Man, this is getting complicated. How, mo how, many, how long do I need to go? Not a 10 minutes, okay. The weirdest of them all is probably the Chrysler Corporation. Whereas Ford added some extra trim and GM shuffled around with some engines, the Chrysler Corporation had a unique approach to the situation. Let's play around with body parts. Chrysler introduced a series of models with Canadian sounding names like Mayfair, Regent and Viscount. These cars are often referred to as Plodges, a mix of Plymouth and Dodge. Why? Well, take a look. This is a 1959 Dodge Viscount. It's a Dodge front clip glued onto a Plymouth body. No, seriously, look. This is a 1959 Dodge and this is a 1959 Plymouth. And this is their child, a 1959 Dodge Viscount with a Dodge front end and a Plymouth rear end with fins. And it boggles my mind. Why make it so overly complicated for yourself? Was this enough of a distinction? Did Canadians fall for this? By the mid-60s, the Canadian car industry was an utter mess. Confusing marks, confusing model lineups, confusing part swapping, confusing price strategies. And one source even mentions that the only difference between a Canadian built car and an American built car was some trim pieces and a $50 price gap. These uh, import tariffs, huh? Were they really all that good? Well, not really. As by the mid-60s, the Canadian government realized that with this alternative universe model loophole, not much had changed in the auto industry. The import tariffs had run its course. And so, an agreement was proposed. The Canada-United States Automotive Products Agreement, better known as the Auto Pact, came into effect in 1965. And it was a gentleman's agreement between Canada and the US auto industry. Canada would let go of their import tariffs on the condition that the US industry would retain or preferably increase the local car production in Canada. This was a golden move. The auto pack proved to boost the capacity of the Canadian car industry and greatly increase the amount of blue collar jobs. In 1964, only 7% of the cars made in Canada were exported to the US. Four years later, it was a whopping 60%. With the auto pact in place, the automotive landscape quickly changed. Canada became a second version of the USA. Gone were these temporary solution brands like Meteor, Monarch and Acadian. And since the imperial preference was abandoned, far fewer English cars were common in Canada anyway. Only Volvo seemed to be somewhat successful, but that's no surprise as Volvo comes from a country that is the European version of Canada, Sweden. And naturally, cars could handle the rugged Canadian terrain terrifically. As I said earlier, from here on out Canada followed the American trends without limitations, like the muscle car craze and the 70s luxury fad. Talking about muscle cars, after the auto pack, GM still offered one Canadian brand, Beaumont, which was Canada's version of the Chevrolet Chevelle, and so were the cars. It received all the high horsepower V8 engines the American Chevelles received, but the body had a decidedly Pontiac design, and the end result was a Chevrolet Chevelle with a Pontiac split grille. The muscle car craze also led to the birth of an entirely Canadian car, the Manique GT. This little roadster was made by a man who formerly worked at Renault and saw an opportunity to fill the gap in a niche market of small European-like sports cars. The GT was heavily based on Renault parts, and after a couple years, it still relied on Renault parts that Renault planned not to produce anymore. And after making 160 cars, the fairy tale that was the Manique GT was over. Other sources also mention this oddball, the Bricklin SV1, but I'm not discussing this one right now as, number one, it's an interesting story that really requires a separate episode, and number two, many people regard this as a Canadian car, but only because the production took place in Canada. The car was an idea from an American businessman, intended for the American market, and wasn't even sold in Canada at all. So, yeah, what do you want? But by the mid-70s, Canada was producing so many cars that plenty of them were exported to other countries, namely the United States. And the embodiment of this is the Pontiac Parisienne. 
Back in the USA, due to two gas crises, GM was trimming the Pontiac lineup and got rid of the largest models. To hastily fill the gap the downgraded Bonneville left behind, GM introduced the Canadian Pontiac Parisienne, which was half a Chevrolet underneath. So, you have a Pontiac Parisienne, based on an American Chevrolet Caprice, with a Chevrolet V8, made in Canada, and then shipped back to the United States as a full-size Pontiac model. My head start to hurt. Only a couple more minutes, okay. Let's move on before this episode becomes a real headache. Around the 1980s, French car companies pulled the plug out of the Canadian market and were more or less replaced by cars from the Far East. Japanese companies made an introduction and if you want, we once again can go deep into the maze of rebadging. Especially GM set up a couple of short-lived Canadian brands like Passport and Asuna. Both these companies consisted of models that were rebadged into the Oblivion. Passport sold the Passport Optima, elsewhere known as the Pontiac Le Mans, Daewoo Le Mans and Opel Cadets. And Passport sold various Isuzu models as well. Asuna was a new sub-brand that grew out of Passport and also sold various Isuzu, Suzuki and Daewoo models. But these companies weren't really a success and both these companies only existed for a couple years before being pulled from the market. By the early 2000s, it became clear that the auto pack brought a lot of good to Canada, but was unfair to the rest of the world. Many car companies complained that it was unfair that they still had to pay import tariffs while the American Big Three did not. The World Trade Organization deemed the auto pack illegal in 2001, and it had to be abolished. And it was the North American Free Trade Agreement that became the successor, but already effectively replaced the auto pack by the time it was abolished. Today, the Canadian car industry is rather vibrant, but threats lie ahead. Throughout time, it has always been a struggle to keep the car companies in Canada. The government made many offers to make it attractive for car companies to open new factories, and through export, Canada is very much dependent of the United States auto market. With the current shift to electric vehicles, especially the US announced to buy American, and Canada doesn't want to miss the boat when it comes to the EV transition and development. And if they do miss the boat, bleak times lie ahead. Alright, it's very cold here in Canada, and I'm going to catch my next flight to the last destination. But I don't know where. It's a tie between Argentina and India. But you know what? Head over to my latest YouTube post and decide which country is going to be my last stop. And, oh, I also added a third option. You'll see. We'll